All right, if you take your Bible this evening and turn over to the book of Mark, you'll find your place in the book of Mark. I want to read a passage here from this chapter. Certainly enjoyed uh, getting exposed to the ministry of the kids tonight. It's been a blessing to be here in the service, and we want to take these last few moments and let God's Word speak to us as well. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Lord, we're thankful tonight for the opportunity for this service. Lord, it's been a blessing to be around folks that love Jesus and uh, to be reminded of your work in our hearts. And Lord, certainly to see these young people and the work that they've done and the encouragement they've had. Lord, we pray now for these next few moments that, Lord, you would allow our hearts to be open. I pray that the Spirit of God would work in a very definite way. Though for 2,000 years, preachers have been getting up, sharing God's Word, helping folks uh, be challenged with the gospel and uh, causing believers to grow, Lord, this, this time is just as important as any time ever that we've opened the Word of God. So I pray that you'd speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. In Mark chapter 11, if you'll notice down in verse 15, and the Bible says they come to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. He taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. The scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. Now, of course, the Lord Jesus had many times denounced the religion of the Pharisees. But he did tell the people in chapter 23 of the book of Matthew, he said, These Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So whatever they bid you observe, that is, they are going to tell you some things that Moses said, which was God's word. And he said, if they tell you what the Bible said, yes, observe that. It says, but they say and they do not. Now, Jesus here goes to a, a place where they believe they control, but it just so happens to be a temple. The temple, of course, built by Herod, but it was a place where the Judaism religion took place. And they were going there to sacrifice to Jehovah God. Now, Jesus got there and recognized that it was not at all, though it was part of the system of the Old Testament worship, it was not at all what it ought to be, and he did not ask the permission of the Pharisees. He went in and began to overthrow the tables of the money changers. And he said that this place is supposed to be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. Now, I recognize that uh, the building that we're in, uh, probably traditionally people call uh, a church uh, they mean the building. I'm going to go over to the church. I do that all the time. That's where I spend most of my time. So, honey, I'll be at the church. Uh, we don't really, the church isn't here. I'm just at the church building, right? Um, many times people talk about when they get onto their kids and say, look, don't run in the house of God. By the way, that's good advice. But anyway, uh, we, it's not really the building. We understand that. It's the place where we meet. But in a real way, God did tell Solomon, he said, look, when you pray toward from this place and you're away from Jerusalem and you look back, uh, there was much typology involved. And of course, that temple had been uh, destroyed and another built. But uh, that temple, of course, God had used it as a physical place to represent his dwelling place as an object lesson. And so it did mean something here. In a real sense, it was the house of God. But you know, today, though we should respect the building that we meet in, though we do show reverence, um, uh, we do take means to say, look, this is a place where we show respect because we meet with the Lord. We know this building, none of them are the house of God. The house of God is this body. It is where the Lord Jesus resides. It is where the Holy Spirit is. And yet when we see this picture, we see Jesus coming in and he's turning over the tables of the money changers, it reminds me that there might be some tables that need to be overturned when it comes to this temple. There might be some similarities because certainly it was important. Jesus was bothered. It disturbed him when he saw what was the representative. Now, God didn't just live in that temple. And even though it wasn't being used properly, he said, this is my father's house. This is a place where uh, he resides and it ought to be treated well. Now, don't equate the temple with the church building, but do equate it with your own body because this body now is the dwelling place of God. And of course, when we meet corporately, we're all here and we say we're two or three, of course, are gathered in his name. There he is in the midst. And it does, in a very real sense, become the house of God. 
But I want to notice a couple of principles that I believe could be very practical tonight when we think about the cleaning up of the temple. Could it be that we need to clean the temple? Well, I notice, first of all, when I read this passage, I see an intended purpose. That is, God's house had an intended purpose because he refers to it as my house. You see, he quotes it in verse 17. He taught them saying, is it not written? God had decreed this. Jesus simply reminds them, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. When this place had become designated at the place where the offerings would be offered and where the veil of the temple was, where the Holy of Holies would be kept and so forth, it was now the place that God says is going to be my meeting place for my Jewish nation on this earth, and it's my house. It had an intended purpose. But you understand today, as the dwelling place of God, as this body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, that there is a purpose that God has for this body. For this place where he resides. Think about for a moment, if you would, the privilege of being the dwelling place of God. I mean, the Bible says in Isaiah 57, 17, Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Now, God is a big God. Uh, we think of him in a sense because all we can do is picture sort of like ourselves. But we think about him being large. We might think, well, he's got, you know, one foot over in the Milky Way and another arm up in an unknown universe, and he is just a big God. But God is not big in the sense that we think he is. He's everywhere. But he's not everywhere in the sense that his toe is over here, and his eye is up in here, and so forth. His whole presence is everywhere, and he inhabiteth eternity. Imagine a God who's so big that simply spread out the heavens like a curtain. You know, we haven't exhausted the end of it yet. I mean, we kind of think we're smart, and we've looked with telescopes and sent out uh, all kinds of things out in space, probes and so forth. At least they say they have. I didn't see it fly over, but they claim it's out there. Um, they say we've gone all the way to the Pluto and Mickey Mouse and every other place that there is out there, and we think we've done, we haven't exhausted it all. They'll look and say that, that uh, star is 969.4 billion miles away. Of course, we just take their word for it, right? But they some kind of mathematical calculation, and they think, but there's a bunch of those out there. You know what the Bible says? It says he spread out the heavens like you'd spread out a curtain. That wasn't all he had. It didn't exhaust God. He says the nations are like the dust of a balance. You think about all the important nations, the Roman Empire, Babylonian Empire, the United States for that matter, all the great nations of men and so forth. God says when it comes to a little balance, where we're going to see how much something weighs, we wouldn't even bother cleaning the dust off of it. We wouldn't pick a point over that. That's what the nations are in front of God. Now a God that big has chosen to come live in the heart of a believer. How much of him lives there? All of him. I mean, God lives in you. You have an intended purpose to be the dwelling place of God. Now, the idea behind that, of course, is God sees fit to fellowship with man. Now, I don't limit him by doing that. He's in me, but he's also in other places. But you say, well, when I go to prayer, I get on my knees and I look up to heaven. Well, that's wonderful, but you don't have to talk very loud because he's right here. I mean, I can fellowship with God. So it certainly grabs my attention to think that here the Israelites had a great privilege. They lived right there in a place where they could walk into a building and say, you know, this is the house of God. This is a place where, where he abides and where he resides. And boy, why, isn't that something? I'll get in line to go see him. And yet they had neglected it and had used it as a place that had become a den of thieves they did not keep the intended purpose, and I've got to be aware today to make sure that if I have the great privilege for God to live in my heart, that I'm in fellowship with him. You know, the Bible tells me if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, that doesn't mean that if I fail or I blow it, but if I regard it, I know it's there, but I just soon not deal with it. I know it's there, but I've excused it away. I know it's there, but I just won't call it what God calls it. Well, there's a great consequence to that. He doesn't hear you. Doesn't mean he doesn't know what you say. He's aware of what you say, but you've hindered your fellowship with him because you're not listening to what he said. You've got some tables that need to be overturned. There's an intended purpose, 
It's a remarkable thing to think that God desires to fellowship with us. You know, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16 asks that question, what fellowship has the temple of God with idols? Now think about it. If your body is the temple of God, what would an idol be? Something you put in front of him. He said, you are to have no other gods before me. You know, if we're not careful, I mean, we can be super spiritual and say, well, I would never do that. But if we're real honest, we put some things in front of him sometimes. I'll tell you, the first thing we put in front of him is I, ourself. Uh, my, my, my needs and desires come before him, but I'm telling you, you put him first and everything else will fall into place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. I mean, God says put him, in, put him first in your heart because he had an intended purpose, and that is a dwelling place. But let me tell you, it's deeper than that. It's wonderful to think that God dwells with me and I can know him, but the second aspect of the intended purpose is demonstration. God wants to show the world who he is through me. Now, that is a remarkable truth. How does God show people who he is? Well, now, he's revealed himself through the Bible. But, you know, the Bible even says, over Paul made this point in 2 Corinthians 3, he says, you're the epistle known and read of all men. There's some people that never open this Bible written with words, and you're the only Bible they ever read. What if the only, per, the only way anybody ever knew anything about God, a heathen, comes into Jerusalem, they walk in and they say, oh, this is the house of God. And they see these people uh, cheating folks out of their money, uh, charging too much and pocketing part of it. Oh, you've got to offer sacrifices to be able to please God. But by the way, I've got them for sale here for you at an exorbitant price. That was an awful representation to the heathen about God. But you know, God lives in us. How well do we represent him? You ever been in a grocery store? And I think all of us can relate to this to some extent, so I've got to be careful um, because we could probably relate. But you ever been in and a kid was just throwing a fit in the grocery store or a restaurant? Now, I'll grant you, I've had to deal with my family throwing a fit in the grocery store. I told Elizabeth, you can't do that in here. But no, <laughs> I, no, sure, we've all had our kids to do that. But how do you respond to them? Okay, you, you see them sometimes, they reason with the kid. They try to give them anything they can to make them hush. Some of them just ignore them, just keep right. And the kid just screams their head off. They go down the cereal aisle, they're screaming. They come back up through the uh, sodas, and they're still screaming. And they go around the produce aisle, and they're screaming. And you want to go help that parent, right? you got some advice. you like to come. So when they do this, and you, you can sense maybe the parent's indifference, uh, you maybe look at it and say, man, they just need some help. I mean, that, I've literally seen the parents say, now, now, son, be quiet. And the kid reach up and whack their parent. I, okay, let me tell you, I've got an idea. Yes, that kid's got a problem. But I have to admit to you, I've got an opinion about the parent. Now, you know, we're God's children. How you act is a reflection on him. I mean, you, you're not on your own. The Bible says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of God and you're not your own for you're bought with a price? I mean, glorify God in your body and your spirit with your gods. We are his representative. Ephesians 2.10, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I mean, you're the one that God saved and God says, you want to know something about me? Look at my believers here. How well are we representing him? Could it be that Jesus walks in and says there's some tables that need to be overturned here? We need to clear this up. We need to make sure this thing's right because it's not a good representation. See, there was a purpose behind it. God was, had his house there, and Jesus said, you've changed this thing. So it's got an intended purpose, but then it's got an irreverent perversion. Not only, if you'll notice, it says my house should be called of all nations a house of prayer, you've made it a den of thieves. Now, I see two aspects there. First of all, they were not using it as a house of prayer. Now, that had been bad enough, right? I mean, God said it ought to be a house of prayer. Do you think they were going there to pray? Some people may have, but the tables that he turned over were from the leaders. These were the religious leaders. They were in charge of this. The average person coming, he was just getting sucked in by it. He might have gone to make it a house of prayer, but he didn't have control over it. But the people who did said, we're going to use prayer as a means to an end to pad our pocket. 
you know, people would come in from out of town, of course, to offer these sacrifices. They'd travel all across long distances. They wouldn't necessarily bring what they needed. So it may have started off innocently enough. They may have said, well, people are coming. They don't have their sheep and they don't have their doves and so forth. So we'll make it available and we'll sell it to them. And then they'll have something to offer sacrifices. It would have been legitimate for them to replace their cost and be able to make it available. If they were the religious leaders, they probably should have sold it to them just at their cost so it could be accomplished. But of course, they weren't going to do that. These men were known for being uh, devouring widows' houses and making money. I mean, imagine they're saying, you know, we're selling these things and they have no choice. They got to buy them so we can charge anything we want to charge. So they would come in and maybe have uh, uh, some money, foreign currency or whatever it be. Well, you know, we'll just make a business here. We'll also change your money for you. We'll be glad to give you some of this to, and, and change it. Now, you know at a fee, of course. Uh, of course, we'll have an exchange fee. They had turned it into a lucrative business so that people, though they were trying to come, no longer was it a house of prayer. It was a house of merchandise. Now, they had a purpose, but now there's a perversion. The perversion is they're overlooking what it was intended to do to begin with. You know, even if they hadn't turned it into a den of thieves, the, the verse he quoted is, the house should both be a house of prayer. Let me say something about your body tonight. Do you know your body and your flesh are not equated? I talked about the flesh this morning. It's always bad to operate in the flesh. The flesh is the, is the energy, but the body's the vehicle. Your body can be a vehicle for God or a vehicle operated by the flesh. Your body is not the flesh. Your body is actually something God can use. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the vehicle that we use to glorify God. It's the vehicle that we use to give the gospel. It's the vehicle that we pray with. You see, the body is significant. It's the flesh that we don't want to obey. The flesh is the problem. The body's not. So if we're not careful, we can take what God did. What did God call this house to be but a house of prayer? Now, first of all, do we use it for prayer? You know, prayer is not uh, just automatic. It's not like, okay, it just happens. Christian pray. We're exhorted to pray. Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, pray without ceasing. I mean, we're exhorted in the Bible, call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Do you overlook the matter of prayer? I mean, God called it to be a house of prayer. The Bible says in James 4, 17, therefore, if any man know to do good, doeth it not, to him it is sin. So what was one of the problems here was they had overlooked, they had forsaken the house. The perversion was a forsaking. Are there other things that we forsake? How do we use this body? We use this body to give. Do you know God doesn't need anything we have? He said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't come to you and ask you for food. He that keepeth Israel doesn't slumber or sleep, so he doesn't need any sleep. He certainly doesn't need you to accomplish anything for him, but he set it up so when he gets something done on this earth, we do it. How does God take care of of his people, missionaries, the local church, the ministry. I mean, God's got a whole lot more money than Bill Gates or Elon Musk or any uh, star you could mention. God could move funds anywhere he wants to move them, and sometimes he does that. You say, well, why doesn't he just move some billionaire to take care of this because he's far more glorified when every Christian gets on board and joins into the job. Give and it shall be given unto you. God wants you to give, not just so you can have some health, wealth, prosperity. Hey, look what God did to bless me, but he'll not be outgiven. You see, it's a, it's a revolving door. I give, God gives back to me. I give and God gives back to me. And you don't give it and say, well, he's going to give me a lot more, and that's a big interest that I can, that's better than the stock market, though it might be. The fact is you give with no strings attached. I'm giving because I'm the vehicle God's going to use to give and then God says, well, I'm going to keep providing, because he does. That body, you could overlook it, you could forsake it. I can't afford to give. Well, no, but God can. You just make yourself available. You're a steward of the goods that you have, and we could overlook giving. What about, uh, of course, using our mouth for God, telling people about Jesus? Who's going to tell them if we don't tell them? 
I mean, we are the ones. We are the people. We are the vehicle. This body is going to be used. Listen, I don't just go sit out by a pond and meditate in my spirit, and I'm going to transfer the gospel to lost people. Now, I do want to uh, meditate in God's Word. The Holy Ghost can empower me, and there is a spiritual work. You know that. But at some point, I've got to use my body to tell people about Jesus. Everybody heard it from a person. The Holy Spirit works through a body. The Bible says, again, the flesh is not, you don't live after the flesh, but the body is used by God. So what do we do? Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. He wants our body. That's the temple of God. There is a right use. And you know what? You may not have perverted it like a den of thieves. You may feel pretty good to be neutral, but have you submitted it to him? You see, first of all, there was the forsaking, but then there was the forbidden. It had been bad enough if they just didn't have a house of prayer, but they turned it into a den of thieves. I mean, that's even worse. It's one thing not to do what they should have done. Now they've done others. So you know, here's what happens. God comes in, looks at this temple. There's some tables in there that need to be overturned. Could there be some forbidden things? This body can be used for great good. We can speak for God. We can be a, a, an instrument of testimony. We can praise God. I mean, everything that hath breath should praise the Lord. God gave us breath. We could use it for that. Um, it could be used very positively, but it also could be used very negatively as well. You know, the Bible says the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. And we know lost people obviously misuse their body. We understand the world has no, uh, they think, well, this is my body. I can do what I want to with it. Well, that might be. It's yours and the devil's. But if yours is God's, I hope you don't think it's yours. You're bought with a price. You're not your own. It ought to be used the right way. I mean, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. The Bible tells us again, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every man may use his vessel. What's your vessel? That's your body to be used for the Lord. So we got to be careful. Now, fornication, of course, is not the only misuse of the body. God's given me uh, eyes. I could use those eyes for the Lord, or I could use them the wrong way. You know, the Bible tells us, I will set no wicked thing before mine eye. Now, if you live and you ride down the highway, you're going to be exposed to wicked things before your eyes. If you go to the grocery store, you're going to be exposed to wicked things before your eyes. If you listen to a political speech by somebody holding a high office today, you might see a wicked thing before your eyes. Um, it's one thing to see it. It's something else to behold it, to long for it, to be entertained by it. I can use my eyes for God as I'm looking for opportunities, or I could use them to hinder my spiritual life. Um, no doubt the tongue could be used. Isn't it amazing? He says over in James 3, a, 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 a fountain should not send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. The same tongue that uses to exalt Jesus can be used to gossip. The same tongue that can be used to tell somebody how to be saved could actually be used in foul language and taking God's name in vain and actually being a terrible testimony for God. I mean, the tongue can be used both ways, right? The eyes can be used both ways. I've got a body, and how it is adorned matters to God. Likewise, women adorn themselves with modest apparel and shamefacedness with sobriety. You know, it doesn't take much today to be more modest than the world because they really aren't at all. I mean, you ought to have some concern as a Christian to say, how am I representing the Lord with my body and how I dress it? I mean, that's important to God. So could it be that, that Jesus walks into the heart and says there's some tables here that need to be overturned? Now, he overturned them. In other words, he disrupted it. He wasn't satisfied with it. It needed to move. The temple needed to be cleaned and needed to be turned over. So for a while, probably straightened things out a little bit. I mean, for some point of time... Man, this is a lot better. We ain't got all these animals here they're trying to sell and make money. I mean, they might have been afraid to start for a while. So for a while, it got straightened out. You know, I hope our desire today is that we would get it straightened out. But, you know, not only do I see here that this thing had a, had a purpose, and then there's a perversion, but I want to take just a moment and think about the purging. 
How did Jesus purge it? Well, I'm not going to turn you to these passages because we're just about out of time, but the first thing he does, if you look back in your passage that you're in, in verse 18, or I'm sorry, look at verse 16, he would not suffer any that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. So he turned over the tables, he stopped them from walking through, then he taught them, and the scribes and the chief priests heard it and saw how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. And then notice, if you would, down in verse um, uh, 27, it says, They come again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and they say, By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority to do these things? You know, the fact is that the purging that took place was, first of all, repeated. I'm not going to take you to John chapter 2, but you know, in John chapter 2, right after he started his ministry, he had already cleansed the temple one time. He came in, made a scourge of small cords this time, and came in and began to wipe out, hey, get out of here, ran people out. I mean, and they, and they asked him the same question, who gave thee this authority? What is, who told you to do this? Well, the question is, who gave them the authority? You see, this body is God's. It, was, it needs to be purged, and it was purged early in his ministry, but now we're in chapter 11, and it needs it again. You know, there's two purgings of the temple that we know of. You know why? Because they move right back in there. Now, I hope sometime maybe God's word was preached, or maybe you've been doing your devotions, or maybe the Spirit of God just moved in your heart, or maybe something challenged you, and you said, you know what? There's some purging that needs to take place. These eyes are not what they ought to be. This, this tongue's not uh, where it needs to be. I've not given my body to God in a sense, or there's some things there that are, that are not making it a house of prayer. I'm overlooking some of these things, and I purge. But I'll tell you this, it's going to have to be purged again. The default is that we go back to using it ourselves. We've got to continue to give it to him. It was repeated. I'll tell you something else. It was radical. Now, do you see Jesus walking in and said, gentlemen, this is not acceptable behavior. This really is not pleasing to the Lord. Did he walk in with a scourge of small, uh, a, a scourge of, you know, cords that he tied together and went, now guys, I really don't like this. That's not the picture I get. I get the picture that he walked in and he saw that God was dishonored. He grabbed him some cords, wrapped them up and said, get out of here, you dirty perverts. I mean, he ran them out. It was radical. You know why? Because it was important. You know, your spiritual life is important. Your walk with God is important. I mean, how often do we probably get dealt with by the Lord? We agree with the preaching. We agree with what we're seeing in the Word of God. We know it's there. And we say, that needs to happen in my life. But then how important is it that we do something about it? We just put it off. It's... Yeah, that's really something that I need to work on. You don't need to work on. You just need to get right. Just deal with it radically. God, I need your help. I desperately need you. And yield it to him. It was radical, but it was resisted. What authority do you have to do this? Now, the Pharisees are asking this, but sometimes we could, couldn't we? I mean, if God wants my body and says to present it to him, he wants me to be a living testimony for him. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's a great responsibility. What authority, God, do you have to make me that kind of a testimony? And all he need do is hold up his hands. When you see the nail prints in his hands and the scar in his side, when you see that you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, when you recognize your sins have been forgiven, you'd be in hell if it wasn't for Jesus. You'd be miserable without him. He has the joy that gives life. He is the redeemer. We know in our heart that, yes, that's the best way to go, but what authority does he have? Well, he created you. And then he redeemed you. He has bought you twice. He has authority over our body. I pray God that we'd have a grace to give it to him. We're out of time, so we're going to stop there tonight.
Lord, we're thankful for your word tonight. 